Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome to Modern Leadership, the podcast where each week we sit down with authors, entrepreneurs, and leaders to explore their journey, diving into the ups, their downs, and ultimately the lessons they learned along the way. Our goal to show that everything is figure outable. And today's guest expert is John Foley. John is a former lead solo pilot of the Blue Angels, a Sloan Fellow at Stanford Graduate School of Business, a venture capitalist, and an expert in the how of high performance teams. He is recognized as one of the top 10 most in demand keynote speakers. And you're going to, you're going to understand why in just a minute. He has worked with over 1000 organizations across the globe to create and sustain excellence in the face of dynamic change. His new book is fearless success beyond high performance. Now, before I bring John on, I want to give a little context to what it means to be a blue angel. So get this. 4,000 people have climbed Mount Everest, Earth's highest point. 536 astronauts have journeyed to outer space. That's worldwide. That's not just NASA. Worldwide, 536. But since 1946, only 257 pilots have worn the gold helmet and flown as a Blue Angel. That's less than 0.01%. John, it is an absolute treat and honor to have you on the podcast today. How are you? Hey, thank you, Jake. First off, I am just glad to be here and uh, very joyful for this opportunity to not only speak with you, but all the listeners. Yeah, and we're just going to have so much fun. But before we jump into your book, which is amazing, we got to get some context. We got to get some background. Tell us this story of how you became a Blue Angel. Well, you know, it started as a child with a dream. I mean, I can remember to this day, I was 12 years old and my dad took me to an air show and I loved my dad. I wanted to grow up just like him. He was an engineer and an army officer. So I thought that's what I was going to be. And then one day I looked up in the sky, I see these six magnificent blue jets. And I remember turning to my dad that day and said, dad, I'm going to do that. And it took about 18 more years, but it came to fruition. Oh my goodness. I can't imagine just the passion. Now, those listening to the podcast know, John, that at age eight, I got into Zig Ziglar. And I know you know Zig Ziglar and you have heard his stuff. I got into it at age eight and it became my passion for my whole life. And now I'm I'm hearing you at age 12 and seeing these jets fly by. Talk to us about these 18 years, how you put yourself in the right circumstances and the right places to get to that dream. Yeah, I I think it's critical, Jake. And and what I think we're sharing is you got to connect the heart and the head, right? So this passion, which we feel in our hearts, hopefully hits when you're younger, but not everybody, right? I mean, I think we're very fortunate and I don't think it matters when it hits. The key is you got to connect the heart and the head. You got to have a plan. You got to have a strategy. Otherwise, there's a lot of unrealized dreams out there. And what comes with that is the resiliency to overcome the obstacles, all the challenges that we're all going to have. I mean, it was not a smooth path for me. So first off, uh, you know, I'm a kid and, and I realized, well, I got to do well in school because I, if I want to be a, become a jet pilot, that's, you know, the first step. You got to go to college and there's many different ways that, that you can get into the, the Navy that way uh, or the Air Force. Uh, and I personally wanted to go to the academies. And, and so I tried to do well in school, but I, you know, I did okay. It wasn't, wasn't the, the best, right? But the point is that when I put in my application, I got rejected and I got rejected, um, because they said I was not physically qualified. And that surprised me. I was, I'm a young kid playing football, wrestling. And it turns out I had something weird called too much protein in your urine. Well, first off, what the heck is that? And second off, what am I supposed to do about it, right? So you know, life always presents us with challenges. And, and I was to tell you, I'll be honest, I was disappointed. And then it took me about a week and said, you know, I better come up with plan B, which was to reapply, which I did. They rejected me again. Uh, then I went through a, a whole year long um, medical waiver process. But in the time, in the meantime, I said, well, I got to be productive. I went to Colorado, walked on, played football, uh, really enjoyed life, but never gave up my dream, got a medical waiver. Turned out I went to Annapolis, uh, which is where the Blue Angels, you know, our Navy pilots, um, graduated there, but not did not graduate number one in my class. In fact, I graduated in a half that allowed the other half to be called the top. <laughs> yes. I've been on that path myself. Yeah. And so, you know, it's just, okay, but I had this dream. The first, first thing was I need, needed to get a pilot slot, which I got 
barely, but now I needed up my great, my game, right? And it's pretty cool. The Navy takes about two years to train a Navy pilot. You do lots of things, go to, you know, ground school and they teach you uh, propeller airplanes. Then, and, and there's a, there's a pecking order, right? And they, they grade every single flight. And they go to the uh, the number one person at different stages, and they get the pick. In this case, the pick was jets, and so I wanted to go to jets and did that. And then you go through intermediate training, advanced training. You're flying jets off aircraft carriers. I mean, that blows your mind, right? So did that. Uh, finished number one. I, I got into a skill I really enjoyed. Uh, started flying tactical jets off aircraft carriers. Uh, at nighttime, pitching deck, you know, low on fuel, a uh, thousand miles from land. I mean, I, I strongly believe that you become a product of the environment that you're willing to put yourself into. And it's it's easy to kill yourself. That's that's not hard. It's easy to be stupid. But what's hard is to push those limits, to put yourself in increasingly challenging uh, dynamics and have the skill, but also the desire, the thirst to get better. And, uh, that's what a lot of the book is about, by the way, this, this ability to continuously improve and get better, uh, with your, your team too. Cause I think there's a personal mastery side. And then of course there's the team mastery side. So after doing that off of aircraft carriers, uh, became a six time top 10 carrier pilot, which flew in the movie Top Gun, by the way, Jake, do you ever see that movie? Of course I have seen it many, many times. Well, we're making Top Gun too. It's going to be out soon, but I actually got to do some of the real flying in, in that first movie. And, um, then I became an instructor pilot because what happens is after you do a fleet tour, you go to become an instructor. Uh, and then from that rank, so the instructor pilot rank, because it's important not that you not only master something and it's for your, your listeners out there as leaders, is you got to be able to teach and influence others. You got to be able to inspire others. It's not just about yourself anymore. Let's unpack that real quick before you move to the next part of the story, because I want to make sure that the listeners are paying attention. Let's get them up here, up to speed on this. Why is it so important that you not only know how to do it, that you could tactically do it, but why is it important that you're able to teach it? Well, because you're going to move on. You see, it, it, it's, it's a culture. And what you want to do as a leader is you want to instill a culture that can sustain well beyond yourself. And uh, that's done many ways, right? So with, uh, with the way that I like to talk about it is this culture of excellence, but also a culture of caring. And in leadership, we need both. It's not enough just to be excellent at your job. Um, you really got to care about your people and your customers and care about the mission you have. And that comes through, you know, people will feel it, they'll sense it. Uh, and so what we did is in the Blue Angels, our, our culture was one of what we call ambassadors of goodwill. Mm -hmm. So it really wasn't about the flying. We just used flying as the tool or the metaphor that allowed you to do something much larger than yourself. I call it a purpose larger than self. And this purpose larger than self becomes where your energy comes from. That's your focal point or your center point. And we had a powerful one on the Blue Angels. I have a powerful one in my company. And I think everybody needs to have this as a center point, this purpose larger than self. And to do that, you have to inspire others and you have to be able to, to teach and lead. And that's a different skill. You'll see it all the time in sports. Great athletes do not necessarily make great coaches. Same thing in business. Yeah, and they think that they do, right? I mean, we've seen often that these athletes will go on after their career and they'll take on general managership of a team or they'll come out and actually try to be on the court and coach. And it doesn't work because the skill set is different and the mindset is a little bit different. And so, you know, as you were looking at your career path, one of the things that you knew that you needed to do and one of the things that the Navy provided is this opportunity not just to do but also go back and to show others how to do it. And, and in that regard, increase your ability to do as well. Yeah, you got it dead on. And I think what's critical there too is when you become a leader – who's actually done it, there's, there's a higher credibility, right? And so in all the, in all the instructional roles I had, it was something that I had already done and mastered, whether it was flying jets off aircraft carriers, flying in the blues, you know, coming up with a maneuver that had never before been done, uh, instituting that into the Blue Angels in 1992, uh, writing the SOP. Well, we got to hear that story. You can't, you can't just throw that one, lob that one out without telling us. Well, what's this maneuver that's never been done? We got to hear it. 
Well, if you've ever seen the blues fly, uh, you'll see there's a maneuver. We call it the section high alpha, but it's basically you stand the jet on its tail and you fly slow, uh, low to the ground. The lift is actually coming up from the engines more than it is from the wings. And it's very precarious. To give you the example, only three teams in the world ever try this maneuver as a single airplane. And that's the Blue Angels, the Thunderbirds, which are the Air Force version of the U.S., and then the Russians. And that's it. Nobody else is even willing to try it. But to give you the idea of the complexity, to put your jet into that what we call high angle of attack, slow speed flight, if you're a Top Gun instructor pilot, you have to be above 10,000 feet even to put yourself into this uh, what we call envelope because the airplane could depart. And if you depart, meaning you stop flying, you better have some altitude to recover. So here it is. Top, the, the best pilots, fighter pilots in the world have a minimum altitude of 10,000 feet. Guess what altitude we did this maneuver on the Blue Angels? Well, tell me. 200 feet. 200 feet. And so, so if I'm imagining this in my head, you've got the nose of the plane pointing up. Up, yes. And you're fl- but you're flying across the ground. So you're going horizontal with your plane vertical. That's it. Yeah. And you're not climbing. You're not descending. You're at a, and, and it's, uh, you're walking. I call it walking the dog. You're walking the throttles, uh, to, and that's what's creating the lift. And it's, it's crazy. I mean, oh, it's you, crazy. Just, just hearing it, it's crazy. It's awesome. Well, here's what we did. So that's, you know, that's, that was just the standard that I got taught. Right. And, and you can master that. It takes, you know, it takes practice. But so then I'm sitting around the ready room one day with Thumper, my other uh, solo pilot, and we'd gone through some training. He was getting really good at this point. I said, Thumper, let's put in a new maneuver. Now that's really hard to do. It's kind of like coming up with a new product or service or offering in a company. Right. Um, and, and in the blues, you don't do this too often. I mean, maybe once every five years, a new maneuver is introduced. Why? Because it's just hard enough to master what we're already doing. And there's a complexity and a flow to it, just like like there is in business. So you're changing those and people typically don't like change, right? So things I like to talk about is how to actually lead through change, right? So in this, in this case, um, we came up with the idea, but ideas are, are, are a million, you know, there's a million ideas. We have to prove that it was safe. So I did all the testing on it, pulling engines back, so all that kind of stuff. What we decided to do was do it as a section, two airplanes. Now, when you do that side by side, that changes the complexity. It's like one plus one, all of a sudden equals 11. OK, I mean, the complexity goes way up. And uh, what the point is, we, we did it. We proved it. it uh, we put it in the air show in 1992. Now, here's what's cool. The Blue Angels are still doing it. You go to any air show, uh, go next week. You'll see this maneuver. Um, it's still being done. And here's the even cooler part. No other team has been able to replicate it. Now, why is that? Because there's a difference between uh, knowledge, understanding and wisdom. Right. So I the knowledge of how to do that maneuver and I can write it up, you you know, throttle settings here. Here's this kind of stuff. But the 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 actual doing of it, it's like a surgeon. Right. I I mean, you got to actually physically do something and do it a lot before you can connect the neurons in your brain, before you get into that level of unconscious competence. Right. Hebb's law, you know, neurons that wire together, fire together. So so you so a you the knowledge is is basic so writing the sop no big deal but you got to transfer that knowledge uh, and that's done verbally by the way and 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 it's done as a mentor as a leader i mean i'm looking people in the eye and, and i'm telling them the lessons i've learned from the mistakes i've made and you're trying to to help people not make the same mistakes but then they still have to do it so you better have the resources in this case i had some pretty cool jets right i had six jets i could pop in and and practice this on uh, and then and then at some point you become a master of that. And then you have to integrate your mastery with the team. And that's the hardest part because you, you know, you have other members out there doing other things and coordinating this, uh, changes things. So you have to know how to collaborate with others. You have to know how, what I call connection and extension, you got to connect to them and then extend in a more powerful way. So this, the, the whole metaphor is, is a company. The whole metaphor is your business. The whole metaphor is your life. Well, as I read through this book, and I couldn't put it down. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. It fired me up it, from the very first page. And you describe what it's like to be in the plane and be, you know, a thousand miles an hour and all of this. It's just, it's a tremendous, it's a, it's a ready go type of book. And we got to get into this book. But before we do, I got to assume that you've had some 
uh, very trying periods when you've been up in the air and something hasn't gone right. Before we jump into this book, I'd love to just hear some challenge that you had up in the air and how you overcame it. Oh, I've had tons of them. I mean, one day, you know, now, now I fly a lot on the back of airplanes because, um, you know, flying all over the world, speaking and, and doing leadership trainings and whatnot, my company, by the way. And, uh, and what, what I, I added up one day, I said, how many times did, have I nearly died? And then, you know, when you say nearly, I mean, where you're not sure if the next second, if you're going to live or die, I mean, that it's different than saying, oh, I kind of, you know, almost went off a cliff. No, I mean, you, you're like, you're not sure, right? You're going over the cliff and you barely grab the rope. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's about what I'm talking about. So about, I actually had nine times that has happened. I've had two midair collisions. I've knocked pieces off my jet. Normally, you don't survive one. I've survived two. You know, um, I've come across on an aircraft carrier so low, blood curling screams in the dead of night where I thought I was going to slam into the back of the carrier. We call it the spud locker because it's where you peel potatoes. Um, you know, I've had out of body experiences where I've actually left my body because I'm so scared. And then I realized that, you know, death's no big deal. It's not going to hurt. I mean, I know that for a fact because I felt it uh, in the last second. Uh, and then I actually survived. And, and then you become incredibly scared where you're dry heaving, you're puking, your legs are shaking. And uh, I've had all these experiences. And what I realized is that with, with, with all these, what, com what comes out of it is a deep appreciation and a gratitude of just the basics of life. Like I'm, I'm sitting here in Sedona right now. I'm looking out at these beautiful red rocks. I've got my wife here. She doesn't always travel with me, and, and she is today. And and it's just you know the the beauty of the day of the knowing you can even take your next breath. You know, is something that I appreciate. And I think that's one of the keys that I call glad to be here is a mental mindset that says I am grateful for the things in my life. Yeah, and there's two chapters in the book. One where you, and it's really the first chapter of the book, the glad to be here. But then you also talk about this gratitude. Uh, one of the things, have you seen the movie Free Solo about the young man who climbed El Cap? Absolutely. So there's a there's a part in the movie where they take him in, give him an MRI, and really look at the way that his brain fires in moments of fear and uncomfortability. And you know, his brain wasn't really firing to the normal levels. For example, he didn't feel fear in those circumstances in the same way that the quote normal person would. And I want to ask you, do you feel like there's some little bit of that within you? There's a great story in the book. And so that's the question. I want to set it up with this little story in the book where you are asked how dangerous is what you're doing? And your response is not dangerous at all. So with that lead in, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I think the quote actually is, it's not dangerous, it's inherently unforgiving. Yes, that's the quote. Yeah, and the, and the difference there, by the way, that was in an interview in 1992 when I was taking the team to Moscow, which had never before been done, and we did, it hasn't been done since. But the, the idea there is exactly what you're saying. That is a mindset. It's a mental way of approaching the world, and it's critical because – what you really have to, what I've learned is that I'm scared all the time. I'm okay with being scared, but I'm never afraid. See, I think there's a difference, right? Fear will cause stuckness. It causes it in your life. It causes it in businesses. Heck, you can see it in nations right now. Scared's different, okay? Scared are the little hairs that stand up on the back of your net. Scared says, maybe I need to make some adjustments as a leader, right? Scared, scared is important, right? So I've been scared a lot. So when you think about what in free solo, what he was experiencing, and I've experienced it all the time, is this ability to compartmentalize and also this ability to be incredibly focused in those moments. Because what typically happens with people when they get afraid is they lose focus, right? And, you know, he, he, he was obvious on, on a cliff, right? Um, and, and so the ability, I've been flying where I've had an emergencies airborne where they, you know, there's certain things you have to do incredibly right. Like you lose an engine going off a catapult, you know, it's, it's full afterburner, full right, full rudder, you know, set the altitude, jettison the things. You have to do these things very quickly or, or you're going to die, right? And, and it's okay. It's no big deal. You just have to get into a state of um, a preparation, a state of mental focus, and then the actual execution is actually fairly easy to me. I actually uh, enjoy those moments. Maybe enjoy is not the right word, but I appreciate those moments where I'm tested. 
Uh, and I always have a deep faith. And here's, here's the final thing on that is I think you have a deep faith or confidence. I think you use like you word confidence. Um, that even if it, if, if you haven't experienced this and you're put into some new situation, you'll figure it out, right? You'll figure it out in that moment based on, um, your training or these other elements. So, um, yeah, I think here's the cool part is you can train to this. There's visualization. There's ability to um, to up your game where you can um, you can get to the states that we are at. And, and, and it's, it's not that hard. And, and it's, it's more important to do it in your normal day life. That's what's more important. Well, I love it. And one of the things that you've heard me say, and that is the goal of this podcast is to show our listeners that everything is figure outable that we can figure out solutions to this. And so jumping into the book, I had laid out at least seven quotes that I wanted to pick your brain on, and they were in order as they show up in the book. And because of that story you just told us, I'm going to jump all the way to number seven. It's found on page 88. And in there you say, at the elite level, fundamentals matter. And I think as you're talking about, you know, firing off of this aircraft carrier and having problems, that the peace that you felt, the confidence that you felt had to do with this thing called fundamentals. And so I want to take you there to that page and have you teach on that. What does it mean at the elite level fundamentals matter? Well, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, let's go with the athletes first. You know, uh, it- I played football, right? And so, you know, as a kid, you can learn how to block and tackle. There's certain fundamentals that are out there. And then as you, as you go up to high school, okay, great. You know, college, I played D1 there. Uh, I didn't make the pros. I I didn't have a chance. Um, uh, but you get into the pros. I talked to a lot of pros, the teams, um, you know, work with Nick Saban and Alabama, we won the national championship and it's all about process and fundamentals. Even though you have these incredible athletes or highly skilled individuals, it's still about the basic fundamentals. Now, what happens is, and then you, you know, what's the difference between like a pro and becoming all pro? And then I was having this conversation with uh, Tony LaRusso. He had me at his charity event and, uh, uh, and Joe Torrey. And we were talking about the difference between, you know, all pro and let's say Hall of Fame, right? And, and those are subtle differences. But here's what's interesting. The fundamentals are still the same. And if you learn the fundamentals incredibly well, and they become ingrained into who you are, your natural DNA, then as you go up these ladders, you can accelerate quickly into these other areas. Without a strong fundamentals, you're not going to get there, right? So it's it's absolutely, that's why they call it foundational. Fundamentals are foundational, right? And, uh, And you need to master those and then... You just keep your practices, you keep your focus, uh, and you can accelerate quickly through the other levels. I think that's absolutely terrific. Thank you for sharing that. I want to take you back now because we glossed over one little part of the story, which actually to me is the most important part of the story. And that is sometimes you have to ask is the section in the book. And this is when you initially got you were put in a position where you weren't able to go to the Blue Angels. Your your career path kind of got stopped a little bit. And I want you to tell us that story and what it means to sometimes you just have to ask. Oh, I love that. So it actually was when I finished my flight training, I had um, – you get assigned, you get to pick uh, what aircraft you want to fly. And I wanted to fly tactical fighter jets. That's the path to the Blue Angels. And I was, I, I did graduate number one. I was the number one guy. In fact, I had the best grades in a couple of years. And uh, I wanted the F-18. At the time, the F-18 was the most advanced uh, airplane. They had just bringing it on. Uh, and and they wouldn't give it to me because they actually weren't, weren't giving that airplane to young pilots. They were transitioning these veterans. So it's kind of like joining a a pro team and being a rookie and saying, I want to be the all pro. It's like, you know, wait your turn kind of thing. So, um, uh, I remember that I I didn't get the shot and they said, no, you know, they said, you can pick any other airplane. They have 14, by the way, they're making a movie top gun, that kind of stuff. And I I didn't like the answer I got because I was like, you know, there's gotta be a way. And so, um, instead of just accepting the no, I called the Pentagon. I got through the switchboard, got the head admiral in charge of all the the real Navy pilots, not the little students like me. And um, first off, uh, I got him on the phone and his Captain Rude was his name. And I said, Captain Rude, the sense of Foley. Uh, And uh, I'm just graduating uh, training and and I want to fly the F-18. How can I do that? And I surprised the hell out of him, you know, and he's like, who? 
why am I even talking to you? You know, how'd you get this number? And the uh, bottom line, he says, I'll get back to you. And what he did was he did his research. He got back to me the next day. I'll never forget. I was in the ready room and that's where all the pilots hang out. This is before cell phones. And the duty officer picks up the phone and says, Foley, Pentagon, pick up the phone. It's, it's Captain Root. And it was a leader who got back to me. And, and what he basically did was he took maybe two minutes out of his day and he mentored me. And what he said was this. He said, you know, Check your, your record. You know, glad you're in the Navy. Things seem to be going well, but you, you can't get the F-18. We're not giving those to everybody yet. But here's what I'll do. I'll tell you the path to get there the quickest. And he said, you got to fly this airplane called the A-7. You got to get assigned to the Midway. I mean, they, these squadrons are going to transition quicker. The point was he gave me a um, knowledge, you know, that that I wouldn't have had. But more importantly, he gave me a path. Right. And he said, if I were you, here's what I would do. And it changed my life. Uh, now, to be honest with you, I, I screwed up that path. I, I actually screwed up my first night landing. I, I was supposed to go to the Midway. I didn't. So I ended up to reinvent myself again, take three more years. But, you know, the, the point is, eventually, I flew the A-7 first, got into the F-18, became an instructor pilot, and then became a Blue Angel. So sometimes your path does vary, but the destination needs to be clear in your mind. Yeah, and I love that story for so many reasons. And I love that last closing comment that you made. And that is, when you have that destination fixed in mind, when you know where you're going to end up, sometimes you see a road that has a, a roadblock. Sometimes you see a road that's been closed down. It doesn't mean you can't get to your dream. It means you just have to take maybe a different route to get there. And in your case, there's two great lessons that came out of that story for me. I mean, there's lots of lessons, but two great ones. Number one is, ask. You wouldn't have got that two minutes of mentoring without the confidence to just reach out and ask. It's always no before you ask. And then the second is just because somebody helps get you on a path doesn't mean that you're going to get to the end of that path. You're still in charge. You still need to be proactive and intentional about what you're doing in order to get where you're going. And so, John, there are so many things in this book that we can dive into. I have a longer list that we could possibly cover in the time that we have. So I'm just going to ask you one last question before we move to the final section. And that is, teach us a little bit from page 67 about this quote, go big in small things. Oh, beautiful. So, you know, I think I quoted Mother Teresa in there too. And, and it says, uh, the small things matter because that's where your strength comes from. And, you know, so that's to me critical. When I was flying, whether it was jets off aircraft carriers, whether in the Blue Angels, whether playing sports at a high level, whether it's, it's me coaching and mentoring people now and, and training and speaking, uh, it's the little things that matter, right? Um, of course, you've got to have a framework, you know, and in the book, I call it the diamond performance framework of, you know, how do you create vision, plan, execute, feedback loop, this idea of beliefs, this idea of visualization and focus, the idea of trust contracts that execute high, this idea of a glad to be your debrief that allows you to actually learn and grow, but it's all based around this glad to be here mindset, right? And so having said that, it's the, it's the fundamentals. It's the small things in trust. You see, it's the small things, right? And you have to earn trust every single day and small things matter. So my feeling about go big in the small things is find out what are those small critical things that are critical in your business as a leader, that are critical in your roles, then and be very, very good at those. Concentrate on those while you're achieving the big picture. Yeah, I think we're living in a time period where being a generalist is no longer good enough. Being the guy who can do anything and everything a little bit well is no longer good enough. We now need to specialize and be experts in certain things. And so when I look at this and I hear this, it's figuring out what those small things that are going to have the biggest impact. What can you do today? What can you do in the next seven days? What can you do that will most move your organization forward? And then really lean into those. Go big on those things and have that impact. And that'll help you stand out as a leader and it will also move your organization forward. So John, this book is amazing. Your story, your life. I mean, we didn't even get into the venture capitalism. We didn't even get into your degree from Stanford. I mean, you've just had an amazing life, but this book is a must read. And now it's time for us to switch gears just a little bit and talk of our last section, the learning from leaders, where we find out a little bit more about you on a personal level. Does that sound all right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Love it. All right. I'm going to go out of order a little bit because I want to ask you this. We're going to put Fearless Success, your book, on our bookshelf. What book needs to go next to it? What is the book that you most often recommend or gift to others? It's, it's called The Diamond Cutter, and it's written by Michael Roach. And it's not as well known as, you know, I could have mentioned another 20 books that are on that same bookshelf, but this is my go-to book. Uh, And again, Diamond Cutter, Michael Roach, what it really does is it takes Eastern wisdom, okay, and turns it into normal day life. So how do you turn wisdom into action? Uh, It's very similar to what I'm talking about, but in a completely different vein, right? Uh, instead of using high performance teams and blue angels, it's this idea of, uh, of a spiritual monk path and you'll find they're close to the same. Yeah, I love it. And as we talked about before we hit record, you know, I spent six months out in Southeast Asia. We did a lot with the, some of the Eastern religions and I just love this idea of centering and peace and understanding yourself and, and which leads to our next question. And that is, Please share a motivational quote, philosophy, or mantra, or something that you live by. It's glad to be here. Uh, and it, it is, uh, it's not only a mantra, it's my life, okay? I, I And glad to be here means more than being grateful and appreciative, of course. You know, like I do what I call my glad to be here, wake up every morning. First thing I do is I say, what am I grateful for? Uh, and then I get down and I talk about well, what happened yesterday that I have something to be grateful for. Because it turns out the human brain doesn't care if you're remembering something or you're actually doing it. So we all get extra brownie points for remembering good things. Oh, by the way, it works the other way too. So be careful what you're thinking about, right? And then you go forward in your day and you say, okay, how can I serve others? How can I help others? Uh, And I do that every day. So that glad to be here becomes a, a methodology, a way of seeing the world and you watch the world changes in front of your very eyes. That's such incredible mindset, such incredible life philosophy. I love it. Thank you for sharing it. Our, our final question then is your leadership superpower. You know, I think it's joyful effort and it, it kind of ties into this idea of glad to be here. Uh, I, I'm a pretty happy guy, you know, but there's a deeper purpose that, it, that joy brings. All right. And I like the word effort because it's, it means it takes some work, you know? And so Uh, I think if you combine uh, the powers of wisdom and love, you get to what I call joyful effort. Boy, I love this. This is one of my favorite leadership superpowers that has been shared on the podcast. And I love it because it's the two elements, right? The happiness, the optimism, the, the power there, but also the effort, the intentionality, the focus that it requires. John, I wish that we could spend another couple of hours, you and I just diving into some of this stuff, and maybe we'll have to do that someday. But for today, any last bit of advice and then tell us, how can we pick up a copy of Fearless Success and how can we find out more about you? Yeah, I would say uh, smoke on, go for it, right? So this idea of reaching your dreams, there, there is a path to it. Uh, hopefully, uh, I've laid out some of that in, in the book, but it's more than a path. It, it's a mindset first. Uh, you know, how you can get it is many different ways. First off, you go to our website, John Foley Inc., John Foley Uh, we've got that book there. We've also got other, other things that I think are tied in good content, you know, to, to stay in touch with us, one liners and stuff. Uh, but you get the book anywhere. I mean, we're already an Amazon bestseller. It's in all the airports. It's in Barnes and Noble. I mean, it's out there, right? So, um, whatever method is easy is for your readers. Yeah. And if any of our readers reach out to me, I've actually got a number of copies sitting on my desk right here. I'm not just a one book owner. I'm a multiple book owner of Fearless Success. It's that good. They need to get it. John, you're amazing. I am glad to be here and I'm glad that you were here with us. You have been a tremendous guest expert on the Modern Leadership Podcast. We cannot thank you enough. Thank you, Jake. And thanks for what you're doing. You're making a big difference in people's lives. I think I need to sit down. As you guys know, I stand for all my interviews. I have a standing desk and I like to, I like the way that I sound better when I'm standing up, but I think I need to sit down. That was an amazing interview. John has had an incredible life. It's so amazing 
to start out with this dream at 12 years old and to go through all the experiences that he went through, the ups, the downs, maybe changing course a little bit and then finding himself doing what he dreamed to do. And that can happen to each of us. When we set our goals, when we set our targets, when we focus on what we want to accomplish, great things happen. And yeah, we might have to take a little detour. We might have to go around, maybe not take the direct straight path. But if we put our minds and our focus on what we want to achieve, the opportunity is out there. I loved sitting down or actually in this case, standing up, talking to John. Everything that we talked about can be found on the show notes for this episode found at jakeacarlson.com slash ML139 episode 139. And of course, until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days and even better life. I'm glad to be here. Remember, everything is figure outable. I will see you next week. Stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Uh